Uh, my name is Micah Lee. I am a web developer for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, and uh, I really like Hope. This is my second time to Hope. Uh, I went to the last Hope, but I didn't make the next Hope. Um, and I was so excited about Hope this year that I uh, was looking at the schedule the other day. And I called up Google and was like, hey, I've been looking at the Hope schedule. And Google was like, oh, yeah, we know. Uh, and then I called up Twitter and said the same thing. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we know. We saw you looking at the Hope schedule on hope9.net. And uh, how do you like Ubuntu, by the way? <laughs> so uh, the reason that, Hope, that Google and Twitter know that I was looking at the Hope schedule is because uh, hope9.net includes uh, JavaScript files from Google Analytics and also uh, Google Web Fonts. And uh, they have Twitter buttons on their website that include scripts from when you uh, first load the website. And so here is just you know, a random sampling of some kind of activist-oriented websites that also give visitor data to third parties. And here's a list of what the third parties are. Uh, and chances are a lot of these uh, people who operate these websites don't even realize that that's going on. So. Um, what data are they giving to, uh, like, what data, what, what of your data goes to Google and Twitter when you visit hope9.net? Um, uh, you make an HTTP request. And the, uh, there's a lot of information in this HTTP request, and it depends on whether or not you have a cookie set in your browser for their services or not. But some of this information is uh, your web browser, your operating system, um, language settings. The uh, refer string is, is where you came from. So if you look at Twitter's logs, you could see a list of uh, uh, everyone who's been visiting Hope's website. Um, and obviously your IP address, what time you went there. Um, and if it's uh, JavaScript, JavaScript is able to get more information about you in the browser, like what plugins you have installed. And so every time um, you load a website or any resource on a website or any AJAX request, all this information gets sent to the server. Um, and so here's some examples of things that uh, include third-party resources. Um, and it's more than just this. It's like, like any time you embed any widget, pretty much, unless it's specifically designed to be privacy-friendly, it's privacy-unfriendly. Um, and so I'm going to talk about ways to get around this and not give visitor data to third parties. Um, so here are some websites that are uh, specifically, uh, like try to be specifically privacy friendly that don't include any third party scripts. Um, and they do this on purpose so that when you visit riseup.net, uh, nobody else knows that you're visiting riseup.net. You, like your visit to riseup.net doesn't appear in anyone else's logs. And uh, EFF is launching a new privacy policy soon, and this is from it. Um, we're going to promise to not include any third-party resources when you initially load the page without giving a user, the user a chance to opt in. Um, and uh, I'm going to show how you can give users a chance to opt in to, to third-party stuff. Um, so why does it really matter if uh, there's giant databases of everyone's user agents and things? Um, so it's really surprising how few, uh, like how little amount of information you need to uniquely identify anyone in the world. Um, how many people live in Manhattan? 11 million. 11 million people in Manhattan. So let's say that there are investigators trying to figure out who one of these people is. Um, and they have a web server log. And they uh, can tell from the user agent that this person uses Fedora Linux. So like out of 11 million people, how many people use Fedora? Two. <laughs> two? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> let's pretend 200. And now let's say that their language is French. Like how many people speak French or have their language on their operating system set to French and use Fedora Linux? Like maybe one or two and, uh, in Manhattan. And, all, and so it only takes a little bit of information to build a, uh, a browser fingerprint. And there's a lot more information than just like the user agent string uh, and, the, and the language settings and stuff. Like, if you're using, you know, a netbook, you have like a specific resolution. You have um, 
uh, you know, maybe you're running an ARM processor and uh, you might have various plugins in your browser that JavaScript can detect and stuff. And so even if you can't trust an IP address to uniquely identify somebody, like, like let's say the IP address is from a coffee shop somewhere, um, you can build a unique fingerprint of them from their web browser. Um, and so the big thing is that third parties can do with this data is log it um, and use it to track you. Uh, and uh, most people log everything for a long time and uh, that means that you know, these logs could get subpoenaed. Um, and last night I went to the WikiLeaks talk, the ACLU lawyers, and they were talking about with the uh, WikiLeaks investigation, this is exactly what law enforcement is doing. They're like subpoenaing all of these services for uh, information about visitors. And you know, Twitter could totally give uh, law enforcement a list of all of their logs with refers from hope9.net and try and build a, a, you know, a pretty good idea of who is coming to this conference, just from that. So uh, my first trick is about Google Web Fonts. Um, so it's pretty awesome that CSS finally works well enough so that you could have any font you want. And now websites are finally stopped like pretty, no more like Times New Roman and Verdana. And uh, Google has this awesome service, uh, it's a web font repository and all the fonts are open source and you could go put in your text and look through fonts, find the ones you want and then embed it in your uh, website. Um, and so it says just add this code to your website. And so what happens if you add that code to your website is uh, when someone loads your website, they'll make a request to fonts.googleapis.com and um, so that's already Google is getting data about someone that visited your website. Um, and then also inside of the, uh, uh, inside of the CSS file, it makes another request to the actual font file. But it's really easy to use these web fonts without actually sending requests to Google. All you have to do is download this WAF file and then just copy this, put it in your own CSS file and just link to your own WAF file. Then when people load your website, uh, it just goes to your own server. Yeah, well, so um, at least the fonts that I looked at, I'm not sure if they have different licenses, but it looks like they're all uh, like open licenses, which means you know you could redistribute them, whatever. Um, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I don't think it's much bigger than like in most images. It's, uh, I mean, obviously, if you're going to not include resources from third parties, uh, you're going to use more bandwidth because you're going to have to host stuff yourself. But it's a trade-off for privacy. Um, and then in some cases you will use less bandwidth, like uh, social media share links, where uh, you know you go and you're like, I want to create a button so I could share this page on Facebook. Um, you go to Facebook's website and they say, oh, here's how you do it: include this little uh, block of JavaScript and or like fill out this form, we'll make it for you. Put this in your website, and then it uh, th there's like a face share on Facebook widget, and it makes like lots of requests to Facebook servers uh, and you know if the user is currently logged into Facebook, Facebook like knows who they are exactly, not just their uh, browser fingerprint. Um, and so instead of doing that, there's just plain H uh, HTML links that you can make that do very similar things. Like for the um, Twitter buttons, it's, you have to like open this in a new tab or whatever. Uh, the Twitter buttons that Twitter provides you opens it in a little pop-up window. but um, but it's much, it, it, this basically is a way to still use uh, social media sharing without including third party resources on your website. Um, and so let's say you want a Twitter button. Uh, I went to Twitter's website and I said I want a Twitter button for my Twitter account. And uh, they said okay, embed this in your site. So I embedded this and I took a look. It makes requests to platform.twitter.com, p.twitter.com, r.twimage.com, cdn.api.twitter.com. And, uh, and you know, if someone goes to this and they're logged into Twitter, actually Twitter uh, now respects do not track, but the DNT header, which is cool. But you know, if you don't have the DNT header, then it'll, um, you know, log that like this Twitter user went to this website. Uh, but all this is is just a, a, a button, you know, that would be really easy to make this without uh, making all of these requests. And so, 
this is kind of a lot of code because the Twitter widget has a lot of CSS, but I just used Firebug, looked at the CSS, and made this myself. And so all it is is just a straight HTML link to um, my Twitter account, and then just a bunch of styling. And most of this is this giant big block of base64 encoded stuff. It's a data URI. It's like, uh, it's an image uh, without having to actually load an image from a server. Um, but yeah, so to have things like that, there's no reason to actually use uh, the built-in widgets because those aren't privacy friendly and you could just make it yourself. Um, so another thing that a lot of people want to do is have their Twitter feed on their website. And uh, Twitter, most people use the Twitter badge. And um, it's this like live updating thing of like a feed or a search or something. Um, but here's an example of an EFF website, Global Choke Points. Uh, uh, where we have a Twitter feed that isn't using the Twitter badge, and uh, all we're doing is loading it from the server. So when people load our website, it builds the Twitter feed from the server. Um, and there's a couple of ways of doing this. Uh, you can do a lot of stuff with the Twitter API, um, but it's really a simple way is every Twitter account has a JSON URL, and you just change the, uh, the username, and you can get a feed, and um, Here's like a couple line PHP script that shows how to display a Twitter feed uh, on your website from the server. And you're not actually sending any traffic to Twitter. The only requests that go to Twitter is your web server is making this request. Um, so Twitter only knows you know, your web server's information and not uh, all of your visitors. Um, so sometimes you wanna use widgets that are a bit more complicated and that like update live with Ajax. Uh, and so, do you all know what the hum Humble Indie Bundle is? Uh, yay! They're pretty awesome, DRM free games, pay what you want, um, and part of the money goes to charity, and so uh, EFF is one of those charities. And so we were embedding this widget on our website, and they gave us this embed code, and we looked at it, and it does like Ajax requests con like as quickly as it can to try and update the time remaining, the bundle sold. Um, and we can't do that because then that means everyone that visits our website will be sending data to actually like, not to the third party that Humble Indie Bundle is using to manage their data. And so uh, what we did is just change the JavaScript around a bit and made it so that it sends the data to our own server. And then our own server goes out and fetches the request from the third party um, and, re and returns it. And so here's like a uh, two line, one line, uh, proxy server, PHP script saying that can proxy Ajax requests. Um, and it's, this one is kind of overly simplicated, uh, simplified. It's a lot more complicated than this because if you have like a thousand people with your um, website open, then they're making a thousand Ajax requests every second and you don't want to be making a thousand get requests to the service every second. You want to make like one get request and return it to the thousand people. And so you have to do, you know, caching and you might have to mess with uh, HTTP headers to get everything working right, but this is the general idea and you could pretty much take any sort of ajax -y widget uh, that, send, that makes Ajax requests to third parties and host it yourself and uh, uh, not have third parties get any of your visitors' data. Um, okay, so letting users opt in before including third party scripts. Um, here is a website I made uh, for, it was a Twitter campaign site um, against CISPA and you put in your zip code and it looks up uh, your representatives and specifically their Twitter handles and lets you tweet at them. Um, and this thing on the right, show me the tweets, is the opt-in thing. Uh, if, if you click on it, then it actually loads the Twitter badge. Um, and uh, here's another example. This is just a, a page on our website. Um, Threatened Voices made this uh, interactive map, Google Maps thing that sh uh, maps out journalists that have been threatened or murdered around the world. And, uh, but you know, obviously Threatened Voices made it so it would load content from their server and then it's based on Google Maps so it loads a lot of Google content. Um, so we just made this and then when you click on it, it actually loads the widget. Um, so when people are just browsing through our website and they come to here, they're not actually sending any data to, you know, Threatened Voices or Google. 
Um, and so doing this is really easy. And here's a quick example of how it works. The HTML at the top um, has a widget div and then a widget opt-in div. Uh, click here to opt-in to the widget. And then, uh, so let's say that you want to embed a YouTube video on your site. What you can do is inside of the widget opt-in, put an image of uh, like a screen from your YouTube video. And then embed code, just put your YouTube embed code in here. And then when you click on the opt-in, it just overwrites everything inside of the digit, uh, widget div with your YouTube video. So uh, that way you could you know, use YouTube videos. But like, if you have 100 people loading your website, maybe five of them will watch the video. This way you're only sending data of five users to YouTube instead of all 100 users. Um, okay, so when you... Uh, uh, when you're setting up your web server and you're logging, you should try not to log more than you need because those logs can fall into the wrong hands. And uh, there's various ways of limiting your logging. Um, and one way is disabling IP addresses. Uh, so my examples are all for Apache, but you can do this in, in most any server software. Um, with Apache, uh, you have uh, these custom log strings and uh, like when you're setting up an Apache virtual host, you, uh, uh, you do custom log, you have the path, the file name of where you want your log to be, and then you say what log format you want. And so, at least in Ubuntu, um, this is where the log format, this is like common is the default log format, and this is where it's defined. Each one of these things is a different piece of the request. Um, I forget what they all are, but percent %h is the IP address. And so you could just copy this, make your own custom log string, and just get rid of the percent %h and call it no IP. And then when you set up your logging like this, these logs won't include IP addresses. Um, uh, but sometimes you might want to know, like, if a thousand requests are coming from the same IP address over and over and over again. And so uh, here's another trick using the software that I'm working on. It's not completely done yet, but it's good enough to use, um, called Cryptolog, uh, where basically it takes the IP address portion of the log and hashes it with a random uh, salt and um, uses that instead. And then this random salt changes overnight, at midnight every night. So you can tell the difference between like one, one IP address making lots of requests or just lots of IP addresses making one request. Um, and it changes your log strings from looking like this to looking like this. But you know, if 192.168.1.118 made a bunch of requests, it'll always, it'll, this IP address will appear in your logs always. Um, and here's how you use it. Uh, uh, there's a Git repository for it. And it's not, there isn't actually like a website for it or a bug tracker or a mailing list or anything. Those are coming someday. Um, but, uh, so here's, okay, so custom log strings let you use filters also in Apache, which means that you can, um, when it writes your logs, instead of uh, just saving your logs to a file, it pipes your logs into a program running on the, on the server. And Cryptolog, Cryptolog is a filter. And so you can tell it to use Cryptolog and then where to write the logs. And Cryptolog also lets you like chain filters. So if you want to use Cryptolog uh, with chronolog, which is a, an Apache filter, or a, a filter that lets you uh, save your log files into multiple files, like, per, like if you want to have a different file for each uh, day that, and with different file names, this is how you would do it. Um, yeah. And then also, modlog IP hash is a, it's an Apache module that does similar stuff, um, if you want to check that out. Um, I mean, the main thing that you get is being able to tell the difference between unique hits and page views. Yeah, for like attacks or for being, for, I mean, you know, if you're just grepping your logs to figure out how much traffic you got to one page on one day or something, you could tell how many requests you got, but that's not how many different people went to your website, you know? Yeah, you want to be able to do that with hash. I don't know, it seems like you want to know the IP address. I think more of the problem is that people are keeping this information forever. Past like a week, you don't really need that information. Maybe you have a cron job that wants to read those through your logs and it doesn't include the IP address. 
Yeah, and actually with um, Cryptolog, uh, you can use the Cryptolog, uh, it's a Python script, but you could use it as a, um, like a Unix tool. You can pipe data into it and get data piped out. So you can retroactively Cryptolog old log files with it too. So if you wanted to keep your IP addresses so you can like block abusive IP addresses, you can, um, uh, you can still do that and Cryptolog your old ones. Um, so uh, a lot of content management systems um, do lots of extra logging that you might not even know about, and especially a lot of plugins do it. Like we found out that uh, Ubercart, which is a Drupal module uh, shopping cart software, um, log, like puts IP addresses in the database for every, uh, every purchase, and we were thinking it might even do it for every time people add stuff to the store or to their shopping cart. Um, and uh, we don't want to log IP addresses. And so here is a way to uh, uh, basically trick your CMS and the plugins in your CMS into not knowing what your um, visitor's data actually is. Uh, as long as you put these lines of code in your website somewhere before your plugins start running, then when your plugins do start running, they uh, when they're trying to access the IP address, they'll just access this instead of what the actual IP address is. You're just overriding these values. And it totally works. Um, so this is more of a, a security thing than a privacy thing. Um, but basic authentication, HTTP basic authentication is pretty awesome and underused. Uh, if you have like an internal web application that just people in your organization use, um, and you want to uh, prevent it from getting hacked, you could, like, let you, if you wanted to, you could use some sort of web app that has users and everyone has to log in. But, um, you know, you might not update it. People might have zero days for that web app, and they might be able to hack into it. But if you uh, uh, put basic authentication in front of the entire thing, then even if people have zero days for what software you're using, they won't be able to exploit them and they won't even be able to know what software you're using. Um, and it's pretty easy to do and uh, I'll show later also that you could lock down just pieces of your website with basic authentication, um, which is really nice. But uh, you have to put this stuff inside of your Apache config file or a .ht access file um, and the auth user file passed to ht pass wd is a path uh, you have to create a password file and manage your usernames and passwords in this file. And there's a, a Unix program called htpasswd that lets you do this. Um, and there's, uh, I think, online tools that let you generate these too, but uh, you can just search for it to figure out how to actually manage the files. Um, okay, and I'm gonna go into the basic auth soon too. But, okay, so I was talking about Google Analytics and how everyone uses it and it's not very privacy friendly. Um, PWIC is an open source uh, PHP MySQL web application that is uh, pretty awesome and it's a great alternative. Um, and it's, instead of using third party analytics, you could use first party analytics. And so, uh, uh, you know, if, if Hope used it, then there could be like pwic.hope.net and then hope number nine.org.org, com, net. Hope number nine.net could, uh, uh, include resources from pwic.hope.net and that will be fine because they're, con they're not giving data in to any third parties. Um, and, you, and they can use it for like multiple websites so they can use the same pwic server for lots of different, uh, for each conference. Um, it's very customizable. There's a lot of privacy settings. Uh, you can like delete old logs, you can anonymize logs as they're getting created. Um, and you could write plugins for it if it doesn't do what you need. And it has cool mobile apps too. Um, but, uh, you know, like any other analytics software, it tracks your visitors. And so, uh, one thing that it does, so by default it tells you to include this block of JavaScript um, at the bottom of your page, sort of like Google Analytics. Uh, but when the JavaScript runs, it does stuff like detect what plugins you have in your browser and detect screen resolutions and save this in your database and maybe you don't actually want this stuff in your PWIC database. Um, but they also have this thing, which is just an image uh, tracker that uh, uh, basically just this HTTP request, they 
get all that data from the HTTP request, but they just don't get extra data that JavaScript has access to. Um, so you could actually not use the JavaScript stuff at all and only use the image tracker stuff. And you can pass in more data. Um, there's a couple of extra uh, get parameters you could use if you want to pass in the refer so that you can uh, like see where traffic is coming from to your website and stuff. Um, and so, yeah, so this is, a, this is a good way. If you're like really paranoid, you don't want to store a lot of user data um, or uh, your visitor data in your PWIC database, then use this one instead because it will store a lot less data. Um, so here are some screenshots that I took from PWIC um, of, you know, browser operating system usage and uh, like traffic statistics. And uh, it's good to keep in mind that like any of these third parties can build these exact same graphs about your website. So if you include a Google web font, Google could build these graphs from your, like uh, about the traffic and um, the browsers and operating systems from your website. Uh, and then also they have all the IP addresses and you know, times of day and everything. So you're, you're basically giving people a lot of information about you or about all of your visitors just by including a script to their server or an image or a CSS file or anything. Um, okay, so here is a, another basic authentication trick uh, to harden PWIC. Um, so PWIC uses PWIC.js and PWIC.php publicly. Like you, uh, uh, if you want to use the JavaScript one, you include this file on your website and the, um, the image is an image to this file. And uh, uh, so let's say that, you know, you install PWIC and you don't want to upgrade it for a couple of years, even though that's a bad idea, or you forget to, or you don't know how secure it is, you can, um, in your Apache config file, uh, set up a password to uh, all of PWIC, and you know you have to have the, the HT password file too, and then make exceptions for slash PWIC.php slash PWIC.js. So this way, um, your PWIC server could have a, a could be completely locked out of everything except for those two URLs, so you can still collect data from people who are, uh, who are visiting your website, but if anyone tries to go there, they won't be able to get any information. And this is also useful for, um, for not just PWIC, for like locking down any parts of your website. Like if you're running WordPress and you don't have users from the public logging into your site, it's only like the people who are on the site, um, you could, uh, lock down wplogin.php and all of WP admin, and that will mean that um, uh, if anyone tries to make any requests to, en to any of that stuff, it'll pop up a password box and they won't be able to get through, uh, which means that even if someone has like a zero day for your version of WordPress or for some plugins that you're using, they probably won't be able to exploit them. Okay, so HTTPS, popular these days, um, and uh, uh, I'm sure there's like lots of information out there about um, how HTTPS is important to use, but it's also really important to use it correctly, uh, and I'll go into more detail about uh, these various steps of using HTTPS correctly, but um, this is a good uh, resource that, that explains some of this stuff, and this is um, Jake Applebaum's uh, 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 Git repository of hardened configuration files for lots of different servers, which is really awesome because I'm just going over Apache, but if you're using Nginx or if you're using Varnish or Pound or anything else to do your, um, I guess Varnish can't do it, but anything to, to do your SSL termination, um, uh, this shows like what Cypher suites to use and has example config files and it's really useful. Um, so, it's good to uh, uh, have HTTPS work on your website and force people to use HTTPS for every request. And it's really simple to do this. Here, you can put this in your Apache config file or uh, an HT access file. Um, it requires mod rewrite, but basically if you're using HTTPS, or if, you're, if HTTPS is off, if you're not using HTTPS, then it rewrites the, the request to use HTTPS and you get a, a redirect. Um, so anyone that tries to do anything on HTTP gets redirected to HTTPS instead. Um, HSTS, uh, HTTP Strict Transport Security, is 
something that's kind of little known, I think, uh, but it's an important uh, part of using HTTPS correctly. And um, Firefox, Chrome, maybe the new Internet Explorers, I'm not sure, but like modern browsers support it now. <laughs> um, and uh, basically what it says is if you go to a website over HTTPS and it sets this strict transport security header, um, uh, it tells your browser never to go to this website over HTTP until the max age expires. And so um, uh, this is important because you could force people to go to HTTPS here, but you know, someone might, they might click on an HTTP link or they might uh, just type in the URL or they might be getting hacked and someone could like trick them into loading an HTTP resource. And if uh, they have an HSTS, um, if they have it set in their browser for this domain, then uh, they will never, their browser won't make the HTTP requests. And here's how you set that up in PHP and here's how you can set it up in Apache. Um, and uh, so the reason why it's important to try and get people not to even make HTTP requests instead of just relying on the redirect, well one of the reasons is um, cookies. Uh, and he, this is a, a, a different way to guard against uh, cookies getting stolen, but when, so cookies are used for sessions. You need cookies to uh, maintain a session on the web. So if you want to log into a website, the website has to set a cookie. And the way that they know that you're logged into the website is because every time you load the website, you send your cookie uh, session ID back to the server. And so secure cookies are, uh, uh, the, the cookie header has a, has a secure flag. And if a cookie is secure, then that means it will never get sent over HTTP. Which means that like, and people don't do this very often. It means that like even if you are forcing HTTPS on your whole website, um, and then you get tricked into loading an HTTP resource, your session cookie will go in the clear and a hacker could hijack your session and take over your account. Um, but if you set the secure, uh, the secure flag, then that won't be possible because your cookie won't get sent in the clear ever. And if you get tricked into going to an HTTP link, uh, you'll make that request but you won't send the cookie. Um, and HTTP only is, um, uh, it's confusingly named because it's talking about the HTTP protocol not uh, like HTTP versus HTTPS, but basically it means that um, JavaScript doesn't have access to read this cookie, which is important because cross-site scripting bugs where you know, an attacker could put JavaScript code running in the context of your browser won't be able to steal your session. So if there's a cross-site scripting bug on your website, your accounts can't get stolen. Um, but here's, uh, all you have to do is just you know, set these to true when you are setting the cookie. But most of the time, you're using a CMS. You're not actually setting co session cookies yourself. And so um, in PHP, there's this function session set cookie param params, where you actually can choose what the parameters for uh, your session cookies are gonna be. As, and as long as you run this before um, the session gets started, then when it sets the cookie in the browser, it will set it as secure and HTTP only. And also this first parameter, zero, is a, uh, is how long it takes before the cookie expires. And if you set it to zero, it's a session cookie, which means it expires when you close the browser. Um, but you could set this to like uh, seven days and seconds or something, and then it'll expire after seven days. Um, but in WordPress and, WordPress and Drupal, uh, you could just put this in wpconfig.php or sites default settings.php, and that code gets executed before the session gets started. And um, you'll have secure HTTP only cookies. So uh, uh, when you're administering your web server, um, use public key authentication if you can. It's better than password authentication. It means that someone like, practic like in most practical situations needs to actually like hack the developer's laptops or something um, in order to connect to the server instead of just getting the password. Um, and then use SSH and, FTP, and SFTP to transfer files. Don't use FTP. It's like really trivial. Like if you FTP to a server uh, when you're in a coffee shop or something, everyone else in the coffee shop could just pick up the username and password. So don't do that. Um, okay, and so here are just some uh, things you can do to help people who are trying to be proactive about their privacy. Um, Try not to require JavaScript for stuff. Some things you kind of have to require JavaScript for these days, 
but um, if you can, make your website work without JavaScript and just have like work better with JavaScript. Um, don't use Flash. That, sh that should just be over now. Um, <laughs> uh, don't block the IP addresses of proxy servers because, um, and this includes Tor exits because uh, people might use it for spam and people might use it for abuse, but people also will be using these servers just because they're censored and they need to use these servers. Um, and make sure you use HTTPS correctly and always use HTTPS. Uh, and test your site with the Tor browser bundle because Tor is, is really important and I feel like it's getting more and more important all the time, especially um, with like all of the revolutions going on. Uh, people are depending on Tor and that's like the most common way that, that people who are being censored are getting access to stuff. Um, and then don't use privacy invasive third party services, but really just don't use third party services unless you could avoid it or unless you at least let people opt in. So at least you, if you're gonna use third party services, make sure that um, uh, you don't use it by default, that you don't send everyone's data. You only send the data that you need to to get the functionality you need. So like only you know, send Vimeo data if people try to play the video. Don't actually do it before that. And like if you have a PayPal button or a Google checkout button or something, do the same thing. Don't actually load scripts from their services because then you're giving PayPal and Google all of this information. Um, so everyone uses content management systems these days, but, uh, and it makes it really uh, convenient. It makes it way easier to update. It makes it um, so that, you know, you have multiple people managing content and stuff. But if you have some sort of high security thing, just don't use a CMS or use a CMS and then just like make a static version of it and have host that instead. Um, because content management systems can get hacked because you know there's a database on the back end. So there could be SQL injection. There's you know some sort of language that's running the code like PHP or Ruby or Python or something and there could be bugs in that code. Um, and that's what like 99% of web hacking is, is hacking content or hacking uh, web applications. If you don't have a web application, if you're just serving static files, then the only way to hack into the website is through the server. So you need to find like an, a vulnerability in Apache or Nginx or whatever your server software is, and that's a lot harder. So if you have like, like a really high security thing and you want to just serve some information um, and, and it would really suck if your server got hacked, then, uh, then just try and make it static. Um, and obviously if it's static, then you can't have interactive stuff like people commenting. But um, if you don't need that stuff, then make it static. And that is it. Are there any questions? Yeah. Actually, with Pewik, um, uh, that th the anonymizing IP addresses part lets you choose how many bytes of the IP address you want, and so you can like choose the the first three bytes if you want, or the first two bytes or whatever. Does but um, I think it depends. I mean, I think the first two bytes is probably provides adequate anonymity. But also, uh, what we do is we have a local geolocation database and just do lookups on the IP address and store the country and then anonymize the IP address. So we know what region people are coming from even though we don't know their IP addresses. I set up a stack website using PHP um, I was wondering if I wanted to add um, HTTPS to my site, would Stunnel give my users adequate protection and adequate benefits? Um, so using Stunnel to to do the HTTPS, because THTPD does, only does HTTP? Um, probably, but it's, it's kind of hard to keep tunnels open. <laughs> but, it, but I mean, it probably, as long as it's, it's set up correctly and you have, like, you know, a, a certificate that's good and signed and... Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could have a static website and still use PWIC. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that that's just for, like, like if you c if if it makes sense for you, then you should do it that way. Like torproject.org um, is static. I think they they like use a sort of CMS thing, but then they compile it into a bunch of static code, and that's what gets hosted. And so you can't hack torproject.org through their web app. Well, not if you're doing it over HTTPS. Yeah. Well, also, I mean, even if um, even if you don't have HTTPS, if you use the basic authentication. It, it'll go over plain text, but chances are an attacker is just someone sitting there on the internet hitting your web server, not in a position to capture your traffic as you're logging in. So chances are, so it still protects you a lot. I, I, I don't know. I think so. Go, go, go for it. Um, so what would be wrong with using JavaScript files hosted on my own site that I bring myself or which are very low options? I mean, nothing's wrong with that. It's just, um... Could you please repeat the question? Oh, uh, what would be wrong with using uh, JavaScript files hosted on his own website um, that, that are well ordered? Nothing's wrong with it. And I mean, a lot of times you have to do it. It's just, uh, uh, a lot of people use NoScript. I mean, not a lot of people. A few people use NoScript. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, people that are trying to be like especially security and privacy conscious you tend to use it and it's good to make your website not rely on it so that it still works. I mean a lot, there's a lot of things you, you can't do without JavaScript so. Yeah. Yeah, so what he said is that um, uh, I was saying that a lot of plugins for CMSs uh, record IP address data, and if you use a reverse caching proxy like Varnish or Squid or something, uh, it won't actually know what the user's IP address is unless you specifically tell it to know what the user's IP address is. Uh, there's, I know that like, um, are you talking about proxies like Tor or? Yeah, yeah. Like how Google will block, like, traffic. Well, so Google blocking, like, if you've ever used Tor and you do a Google search and it makes you enter a captcha and it's really annoying and, it, and it's slow. Um, uh, the, I think that the main reason why Google does that is because people um, abuse the Tor network. And so people, I think, that they, I think that they do that with any IP address that they detect is abusing their their server. And so uh, that's, but because people abuse Tor exit nodes, that's why they got blocked. But also, um, uh, it's publicly look, you can publicly look up IP addresses to see if they're Tor exits. So you can, so it's easy to detect Tor exits. It's not so easy to detect other proxies. Uh, Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. And it's actually, that's, it's built into Pwik. You can um, uh, set up a cron job to delete logs. So like, um, you log individual rows that connect your IP address, your user agent, and like other, and like what web, what page you hit um, in a database. And so if you get a lot of hits, then this tables fill up really fast. And you can tell it to um, aggregate all this data. So it, so it's in aggregate form, you can just see like, what web browsers people are using and like what um, countries people are coming from, but you can't actually connect that like someone from this country was using this web browser and then just delete the individual logs. You said a lot of people are using Tor uh, exit nodes. What kind of abuse are you doing? I mean, I'm not, I'm not really sure, but um, I think. I, well, I mean, people also like hack through Tor. I don't know about, I don't know what, what Google does to, to figure this out, but. Um, so Flash for web sockets. <laughs> So a problem with Flash is that um, it doesn't work over Tor. I mean, you can use Flash when you're using Tor, but Flash is a vulnerability. Flash can be used to uh, de-anonymize you. And so if you, someone is using Tor and also trying to use, and also using Flash, which the Tor browser bundle doesn't let you do um, by default, uh, uh, then it won't, like, it won't work. And also Flash is just really, uh, ugh. Well, you don't get that stuff for visitors to your website. Not all, like only people that like fill out a form on your website, right? So just, so just, you know, collect what you need to collect, try and keep it safe, but don't, um, don't track everyone on your website as much. Um, Repeat the last question. I didn't really know what well, Specifications for running uh, for hidden services, HTTP services, which obviously means whole lots of other questions like blocking refer server side for the users and so on and so forth. Has anybody done any specifications on that? So has anybody done any stuff on um, uh, blocking refers server side and Tor hidden services and stuff? Um, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you can't really block refer to server side, but you can pass your links to something like, do you refer me? And that would get rid of it. Yeah. But it's all done client side. So I don't know. Yeah. I have sort of a comment. Uh, for people who are asking about, can I use Flash, or can I use JavaScript, or whatever I need to CMS? And correct me if I'm wrong, I think what you're saying is, don't not use any of these tools ever. Just know that each one you use increases the attack surface and increases the potential for leaking. So obviously, if you need JavaScript, use it. But don't just throw it around if you don't really need it. Just that attack surface. Yeah, yeah. You could. Yeah, you could definitely use JavaScript, and CMSs are great and stuff, but it, you know, there's ways to harden it, and there's ways to make it so that you aren't leaking private, private data of your visitors. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. I mean, you could also do the, the like, opt-in thing, like don't actually include the iframe until people click something. And that's, and that's an example of using JavaScript. Like, if you want people to be able to, like, look at this Vimeo video, you have to use JavaScript to do that. Um, like if your server gets hacked and they get your password list? I mean, that kind of sucks when that happens anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't know. I actually haven't looked at like what hashing HT password files use. I, I just use the... Okay, which isn't good. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure if there's ways to make that better or not. Uh, anyone else? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I don't know, because it's not easy to do this stuff. It's like, like, if you want to include a widget and proxy the Ajax request and stuff, you have to, like, kind of have a pretty deep understanding of all the moving parts to do that. And so, um, I don't know, like, I wish it were easier. Like, I think us making more privacy-friendly uh, stuff that's easy. Like, if, uh, uh, if one, if, you know, when you make embed code for people to embed stuff on their websites, like include the opt-in thing yourself so that everyone will have this opt-in and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I know there's a lot of people who like are like an activist and they make a bunch of websites for all of these groups. Like I, I've made websites for like 20 different groups in the past several years and uh, if I had, and like this was like eight years ago and stuff, if I had known all this stuff back then, all the websites they would have made would have been much more private. And so I think that, like, the nerds who are in activist groups, who are, like, the people making the websites, if they learn this stuff, like, um, then I think that that is a good way of doing it. Yeah. Well, all the free, I mean, it's not like if you install Drupal or WordPress, it will be unprivacy friendly by default. It's just that um, people on top of that add Twitter buttons and stuff. And it's, I think that it, that there's no way of use. it's impossible to use Google Analytics in a privacy friendly way. You just can't. And so there's nothing that we could tell Google to make it more privacy friendly because we're sending them all data. It's just the nature of how third party services that you hook into your site work. Um, which sucks because there's a lot of stuff that's really cool that's like the modern web is like a platform and you stick everything together and like PadMapper, it's like it scrapes Craigslist for, you know, apartments and then puts them on a map for you and it's awesome, but it's impossible to make PadMapper without like sending all of your visitors data to Google. Unless you like, you know, use OpenStreetMaps and host the whole mapping database yourself or something and then that's like a lot more expensive. And so, uh, I mean, I think that some of this stuff is just hard to do and um, uh, for people who are especially higher risk, like activists, it's important to, to just take those trade-offs. Right. So how much of these problems is la laziness on developer side and how much of it is uh, like uh, just, the just the world we live in? 
I, th I mean, I think that developers don't know about this. I think that like there's tons of people who are making websites for like you know different occupies in like Texas and wherever else who have no idea that they shouldn't be including Google web fonts from Google servers. And they you know like if they knew about it, maybe they would do it, but they just don't know about it. So that's why I'm I'm giving this talk. <laughs> Uh, okay, I think my time is up now. Thank you.